I'm Thomas Baldrick here at ASCO 2013, and in this moment, I'm a thorn sitting next to a couple of lovely roses. They are Dr. Jimmy Holland and Dr. Elizabeth Harvey from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Thanks for being here, ladies. Oh, we're delighted. <laughs> so we're here to talk about treating the whole patient, not just the tumor, or as I like to say, treating the person, not just the diagnosis. From a personal standpoint, why has this been so important to both of you? Well, it's important to me because I was married to an oncologist early on and was very interested in how people react to illness. And so it was an easy thing for me to become interested in cancer because it happens to people at all ages, across all countries. And so when I wanted to study how do people react to illness, cancer was a, a superb model. But not only that, I began to see people didn't know their diagnosis, they didn't know what was happening to them, and it was a truly neglected area that I began in 35 years ago. So that's it sort of defines me and my professional career. That's why I've been interested in it and why okay. I'm here. Liz, why are I, you here? I actually, I am a um, cancer survivor in my early 20s, way back in the 60s when Jimmy's talking about the era in which cancer was a stigma, no one talked about it. And it was very a very lonely experience um, going through that. So um, I'm very passionate about being able to provide that service to patients and think it should be a part of every cancer patient's option to be able to talk about the experience because it really turns people's lives upside down. So you both have a lot of experience in this area. And as I sit here and do the bath in my head, I can figure you both started around kindergarten. That's probably... <laughs> All right, but seriously, how have things changed over the years? Well, I began at Memorial in 1977, and there was no mental health service there. The social workers had to be the front line and do, do all of it. And we created a training program for psychiatrists, psychologists, and when Memorial got interested in it, then other cancer centers did, and it's had a ripple effect, so by the 80s, we were having some national conferences and then international conferences, and so there was a kind of a, a, a groundswell of, gee, this is an important part of, of patient care, and we've been neglecting it for a long time. And since then, we've just seen uh, changes, I, I would say a humanizing of, of medicine, uh, a, a change in the, from the from being kind of oriented towards what are the needs of the oncologist to what are the patient's needs. It's a patient-centered medicine, we now call this. And that sort of says attention here first and then to our own needs secondly and to the needs of the hospital and the clinics and so on. So we've seen things change and there have been some recent changes that have begun to put this area in the forefront. For example, um, the Institute of Medicine in 2008 after a year-long study of do psychosocial interventions help, found out, yes, indeed, there's evidence based for using these things. So they mandated that quality cancer care had to integrate psychosocial into routine daily cancer care. Big, big policy decision for us. And the second thing that's happened in the last, in 2012, was that the accrediting body for our smaller cancer centers, of whom there are about 1,500 in the country, now to be accredited by 2015 have to have a program that includes psychosocial care and identifies people who are distressed and refers them. So now we have a stick. We've had a carrot all along. Now we have a stick to say you must begin to think about this and put this into care. So that's why Liz and I are here to kind of get the word out to oncologists that this is, this is a, a, an essential part of patient care. How many were able to create change with just the carrot and and how many really need the stick well good question I, I think that most of the big centers today have some kind of program it be a mix of professionals but you know psychologists psychiatrists social workers nurses chaplains we all do the same kind of thing and so there's a different mix in different places but it's not mandated and so there are places that have none there's places that just don't refer people to get help when they're distressed. And so, but I think it's not 
because people don't want to do a better job, but well, I'm too busy, it costs too much, I'd have to hire another social worker, all of these kind of barriers yeah. come mm -hmm. up. Well, there are barriers. I mean, the, the physician doesn't have the time. He's focused on the treatment. He doesn't want to sit there and have to talk to the patient, nor is it his job. And then the nurses are busy. The institution is worried that if these patients are identified, they don't going to have the resources to help them. So for them, if they find these distressed patients, they'll have to come up with the resources to provide services. And one of the services that the American um, Society of Psychosocial, um, American Psycho Psychosocial Psycho Society um, offers, um, which we think will be particularly helpful now, is a referral helpline. And this is a toll-free number that patients from all over the country can call in and find a qualified mental health professional in their area who has experience working with cancer patients, which is really important compared to mental health professionals who don't have that experience. So that part of, of, of letting everyone know that this new edict has come up and that this change will occur, it's also to to let these centers know that there is some help out there in getting referrals, which is going to be one of their biggest problems. So that that's another piece of information that we would like all of these centers to know that this help referral helpline does exist, free of charge, 800 numbers. It might help the oncologist to, to, to be able to say, look, I, obviously you're upset, why don't you call this number and they'll give you somebody mm -hmm. near your home so yeah. they don't have to find, to make that connection right. because mm -hmm. they don't know the mental health community by and large. I guess if there's a silver lining or a bright side in that even though just hearing the words you have cancer or dealing with the, uh, the ramifications of having cancer, they are what they are, but there's never been a better time to have cancer. Mm -hmm. That's probably true. I think you that's know. very true. People are living longer with tumors that used to be quite lethal, like lung cancer, for example. People live long colorectal cancer, mm -hmm. breast, prostate, disease, the ones that affect older people by and large. But they're living much longer today. And of course, we have a whole new population of people who are survivors of tumors very often of, of the earlier age, of younger ages, but survivors have needs too. I mean, it isn't all over when the treatment's yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, we sit here at, at ASCO every year and, and we, we talk to people about the exciting research that they're doing and the very positive results that they're getting in terms of treatment. What do we need to do in your opinions in order to bring it forward in treating the entire patient? You mean from ASCO's point of view? Well, I no, I mean from, from your point from, of view. From the, my point, our point of view, I think it is to inform oncologists, particularly because they are the leader in, in any cancer center, that they understand that it, it, it isn't adding more staff to do this, but it's a change in attitude. I mean, for example, in our guidelines, if you can, if you can ask the simple question, what's your level of distress today, zero to 10? If anybody who says it's over four needs to be followed up, well, why are you upset? Is it your kids at home? Is it the cancer? What is it? Because we've used that with pain. How is your pain level? Zero to 10. Today, that's a quick, sharp way of, of getting at what's, what's your level of pain. And, and if it's over five, you need to be consulting some, somebody. Dr. Around. Harvey, final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I think that I have spent a lot of my career um, in uh, academics and cancer research and developing cancer drugs, and I think that the focus has been on developing better cancer drugs and not been on helping patients cope with the actual cancer itself, and it is treating the whole patient. And what the Institute of Medicine report said, which is so important, is that that is just as important as the medicine they receive. And so because of all the circumstances Dr. Holland has mentioned, now is such a critical time for us to implement those guidelines. So I'm very excited to have this opportunity to communicate this to all of the community oncologists out there. So I think the care of the whole patient impacts their quality of life, but it can also impact survival. If you are so depressed or so anxious that you do not get your 
to your treatment, to your chemotherapy, or you don't get to your radiotherapy every day, you have altered your outcome and made it less good than it could be. So treating their distress may indeed have an impact upon their better survival. Great. Ladies, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you for your thank you caring hearts much. in your world of cancer care. Thank you, Mr. Thorne. <laughs> <laughs> okay.